This is London, but broadcasting to you, of course, all over the world, thanks to the wonders of the internet and SputnikNews.com. We're also on FM in the Washington, D.C. area of the United States. 105.5 are the magic numbers there. And on AM across the United States, from sea to shining sea. But this is a radio show with pictures, and chances are you are watching as well as listening to the mother of all talk shows. If you are on Facebook, please share, share, and share again to your followers, your friends and contacts on that medium. We need to get back up to the one million view number. We achieved a staggering increase last week, 38% on the week before, but we're still short of that million mark. We've only been there once and I'm determined that we should get there and stay there. You can watch on my own Facebook, George Galloway Official, or on RT's, RT UK News, RT.com, Facebook pages. You can watch on my YouTube channel, George Galloway Official, and on RT's numerous uh, YouTube portals. You can watch even on Twitter. And you can watch, as many people are, on Instagram. How's that then? Now, I said at the beginning, it's all kicking off, and I didn't just mean uh, Old Trafford, but well done, lads. It's kicking off everywhere. Let's start with the coronavirus. It was once a hallmark of the British people that they had a stiff upper lip. Now it seems their backsides are twitching because they're literally fighting each other in supermarket aisles for, of all things, toilet paper. People are stealing hand gel from the toilets of charity shops. People are robbing each other of things they think are going to be running out in the midst of this hype, this extraordinary panic that is spreading around the world. Now, I'm no medical expert, still less a scientist, but I do know that we breathe in millions, actually hundreds of millions, of viruses every day of our lives, every day of our lives. I do appreciate that this one is particularly virulent. I do appreciate that its lethality is greater than the common cold or the influenza that we get every year. I realize that the numbers are increasing exponentially. But I have to question the way that the media is fanning the flames of hysteria and panic here and around the world. I watch football as I do every weekend. The players are not even allowed to fist bump each other before the game, although they all hug each other at the end of the game. And there's 80,000 people breathing viruses on them from the stadium crowds. It's not immediately clear what is achieved by not allowing Frank Lampard to shake the hands of Carlo Ancelotti. As a matter of fact, um, Chelsea gave them a good tanking this afternoon. But it's not immediately clear why uh, it's spreading so virulently in certain places. In the north of Italy, where the football is now being played, I understand, behind closed doors, and where whole cities, whole regions are being placed in quarantine. The last news broadcast I heard said 11 million people in Lombardy are now in quarantine. They're not allowed to leave their place. And in Korea, the numbers are vaultingly increasing. And in Iran, where no less than two members of parliament have died, and a close advisor to the, uh, the supreme leader uh, of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, has also expired. China seems to be on top of the problem. The number of new cases in China is falling, but it's rising, uh, as I say, at quite a rate. Uh, around the rest of the world, including here in Britain, where the British government seems to have made no real preparation for anything at all, beyond telling people to self-isolate themselves uh, or get along to a hospital where they're already treating people on trolleys and where there's absolutely no spare capacity. And if you happen to work in a place, I suppose like me, I can't self-isolate because if I don't show up, 
I don't get paid. And that's the case for millions of people in Britain. And then there's the United States of America, where there's no health service at all. And where the candidate who is running to institute a national health service in the United States is being caricatured as a Russian agent. Although he's Jewish, caricatured as an anti-Semite. He's being caricatured as too old for the job when his only remaining rival literally cannot string a sentence together or even properly deliver his own name. The cognitive challenges of Joe Biden will be under the microscope with my colleague Rachel Blevins from RT America in just a few minutes. What's going to happen now on Super Tuesday, which happened actually not to work out in quite the way the media spun it. First of all, there are real challenges and arguments and question marks about just how well Joe Biden actually did do on Super Tuesday. In the exit poll in Massachusetts, for example, uh, he um, was 5%, a full 5% behind what he actually got in the ballot box. And voter suppression amongst young black people in Texas is now a thing. Guess what? Young black people in Texas were almost all of them there to vote for Bernie Sanders. But even if you accept that the results delivered by Super Tuesday are as they were reported to be, it's neck and neck, effectively, between Sanders and Biden. And so people will remorselessly focus on these cognitive challenges and the creepy, sleepy behavior uh, of Joe Biden. And people who say it's not very nice, uh, people who say it's, it's exploitative and so on, well, obviously, in ordinary circumstances, they'd have a point. Nobody wants to make fun on someone with dementia. But if you're the Democratic Party and you're thinking of putting up a demented man against Donald Trump, don't ask yourself what I'm saying and doing about it. Ask yourself what Donald Trump and the big money behind him is going to do about it. Ask yourself if Donald Trump will not play with Joe Biden as the cat plays with the mouse immediately prior to killing and eating it. That's the image you have to keep in your mind. It was, as I said, kicking off in Idlib last week until the talks between President Putin and President Erdogan of Turkey took place in Moscow. A new arrangement was reached. Will it hold? Will it solve the problem of the bastion, the last bastion of the head-chopping, throat-cutting Islamist barbarians who are holed up in Idlib under Western as well as Turkish uh, protection. Uh, we'll be asking Marwa Osman, an expert on the area, on the region, uh, about that later in the show. I think I told you we'll have Dr. Ranjit Bra. And guess what? We're about to do a spin-off show called Moats Medic and Dr. Ranjit, who's the 21st century answer to Dr. Kildare. Didn't he look handsome in his scrubs? We hope that he'll do a regular Moats Medic show uh, for us that will spin off of the main Moats vehicle. Thinking of doing one on football too, Moats football, hosted by yours truly. And my old pal Ron Mackay. Nobody knows more about football than he and I put together, partly because we're about 120 years old between us. And we'll be talking as well as about the American elections, as well as coronavirus, as well as the situation in Syria, about the deadly outcome of the third Israeli general election this year. Despite the hype, Netanyahu lost. He still does not have a majority. He is still indicted. He is still facing prison time, but he's still trying to be the prime minister of Israel. What could possibly go wrong? Of course, the fact that the election was fought between two men, Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu, who are the closest thing to Tweedledee and Tweedledum that I've ever seen running against each other in a political election, uh, is, of course, a part of the problem. But we'll be talking to the greatest living 
Israeli, to the doyen of Israeli writers and journalists, Gideon Levy of Haaretz, is the man, the bravest man in Israel, the clearest man in Israel, and there's nothing he doesn't know about Israeli politics. But there are other aspects to the show this week. I'm going to start a, a paper uh, review, what the papers say. That's a new uh, item that will appear on the show. Later in the show, I'm going to launch the Moats Book Club. I'm going to announce and talk briefly about a book, and four weeks from now, we are all going to discuss it. And I hope that you will get the book one way or another. You'll borrow it from the library, or you'll read it online, or you'll get yourselves a copy so we can have an informed discussion about it. That'll be coming up in the final hour. And just to give you a heads up, the book I've chosen to kick off the Moats Book Club is The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist, a book that made a very great impact indeed on me. So lots of new features as well as the old reliable tweets and emails and above all phone calls uh, from you. So it's going to be a terrific show as well as the Hall of Fame and the Wall of Shame of course. Let me tell you that tonight is a little bit controversial. This is the College of Knowledge. It's the Open University of the Airwaves. It is the mother of all talk shows.